Renard from Chicago sent us an email asking if we could talk about an article in Fusion about Ubisoft's game Watch Dogs 2. I reached out to the author, journalist Charles Pulliam Moore, and I'm happy to welcome him to the show to talk about it. Welcome, Charles. Hey, Megan. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks for coming on. So the game trailer came out last week, uh, and immediately people online had a lot to say about the new main character, Marcus Holloway. What's yeah. Marcus's backstory? Um, so Marcus is a black activist who's originally from Oakland, California. Um, and the game sort of centers around uh, this one moment in his life where he is falsely imprisoned um, because a, uh, I'm not really sure how to describe it, like a pre-crime algorithm, right? That's sort of like analyzing what traditionally happens in his neighborhood and assumes that something's going to happen. Uh, the police come through, they scoop him up as opposed to whomever actually committed the crime. Um, and because he is a hacktivist in the world of watchdogs, he uses his tech to break out and sort of, you know, the adventure commences from there. So, so what kinds of things were, were gamers saying online uh, about this character after they saw the preview? Um, the sort of kind of like, a standard issue problematic things that tend to pop up whenever you hear about black people in tech, right? Like, oh, like, why would a black person be living in San Francisco? Even though Marcus is from, um, he's from Oakland, the game takes place mostly um, in San Fran. And unlike the original Watch Dogs, which was set in, like, a Chicago that was kind of unrecognizable, I say this as someone who used to live in Chicago, this San Francisco is very clearly based on the San Francisco that we are all sort of familiar with, right? Um, so you've got people living, like, very bohemian in lifestyles, you've got people living in poverty, and then you've got this um, this upper class of like high class tech workers, um, of which Marcus is one of them. And people were like, "Well, that's just not realistic." Um, there was one particular um, thread in Steam about how you know, oh, this is another instance of social justice warriors trying to force their agenda down our throats. And it was all just kind of like, uh, okay, all right. <laughs> Why? I mean, why aren't the big gaming houses kind of using their reach to be a little more representative as far as this kind of thing is concerned? You know, people people respond, you know, be, because I guess because they don't they're not used to seeing you know something outside of the the traditional white homogenous dude archetype. Why why aren't gaming companies kind of using their their kind of power and ability to kind of spread it out a little bit? Um, it's just sort of, I think there's like, there's a lot of different forces at work, right? Um, you have these publishers who are very accustomed to making a very particular kind of game. They usually tend to be centered around um, nondescript white men whom the gamer is supposed to be able to project themselves onto. The first Watch Dogs is main character. Um, goodness, his name is escaping me. Uh, honestly, like that's like that's part of it. He's supposed to be <laughs> this sort of like nondescript white guy. And you're supposed to be like, oh, look, that could be me. Mm -hmm. um, Let's call him where, Pierce. Sure, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but with Watch Dogs 2, it's just sort of like, no, 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 we're going to tell a very specific kind of story that is somewhat grounded in reality. Um, increasingly, you're seeing more and more publishers be like, well, you know, we have been doing this, you know, since the beginning of, like, since we've been in this business. And at the same time, there's a very vocal contingent of underrepresented uh, people, women, queer people, people of color, you know, they're like, we've been spending our money and our time and our energy playing these games. Um, it's about time that we were able to see ourselves in them more. Sure. So uh, we talked a couple weeks ago about The Sims and modding, and this was something that I'd heard of, but I hadn't really, um, I didn't really fully understand. But you write that a lot of people were saying, well, we should be able to mod our white face onto Marcus Holloway's face. Why can't we do that? Um, is that something right. that people have been asking for for a long time the other way around? Like, why, why can't I make every white character black? Honestly, like, that complaint only comes up when there's a black character. It's like, well, I can't see myself on this person anymore, and I sort of feel like I shouldn't have to spend my money. Um, but that being said, uh, earlier this year, there was actually a really interesting instance in which there was this pushback um, with an indie game um, called Stardew Valley. Um, it's a, uh, how to describe it? It's a farming game. Um, it's not quite like Harvest Moon, but the idea is that you inherit a farm from your grandfather. You move back to the farm, you farm the land, but the real like meat and bones of the game is where you go out into the community and you build these relationships, friendships, romantic relationships. Um, most of the characters are white, um, canonically. Um, there are a handful of characters of color, one of whom, Maru, was um, biracial. Um, she had one black parent, one white parent. And a mod came out that allowed you to make her skin lighter. Um, and a lot of people were like, well, what, why? You know, why is it that in a game that's so dense with white characters, you would want to make one of the few characters of color look more white? Um, that was a conversation, again, that popped up on Steam. 
Um, but in response to that, something really interesting came out of it. Um, the Diverse Star or Dew Valley project, um, which sort of took that initial mod and turned it on its head and said, well, we've already got this game, you know, that's got a hand, you know, a couple of dozen white characters. Why not make it so that the residents of Stardew Valley are from all kinds of backgrounds, right? Um, so this follow-up project allowed you to um, create a really vibrant, diverse community, whereas uh, as initially you only had two characters of color, um, using this mod allowed you to sort of like um, basically create a world that was a bit more reflective of the one that gamers are actually playing in. Um, and from there, the conversation has been sort of fraught around this one particular indie game um, about, well, you know, why is it okay for me to make a white color, I'm sorry, a white character, um, a person of color, but not in the opposite. Um, so there's like, it's, there's, it's two sides to a very like complicated conversation. And I think that's where a lot of people who do mod want it to be, you know, it shouldn't just be a one directional thing. Um, it's just that historically it's been mostly white characters. So Watch Dog 2 was announced at E3. Was there, is, was there more conversation about this when there was more to see from the game? Um, so far, like a lot of the buzz online has just been about how it's looking to be the game that Watch Dogs 1 should have been, um, in that it's supposed to be this immersive, um, true to life real world experience that's, you know, slightly heightened. Um, the way that a lot of people are describing Watch Dogs 2, it's like, oh, it's like Assassin's Creed, but in San Francisco, um, where parkour makes a lot more sense. <laughs> um, um, and it's just sort of like, I feel like that buzz is actually sort of the subtext to a much larger positive conversation, right? So if uh, the initial big hit of buzz was this uh, fallout, not fallout, uh, this negative backlash to the fact that the character was going to be a, a man of color, the fact that the game looks like it's going to be fantastic and sort of right some of the wrongs that the initial game sort of set up. Um, you know, critics love Watch Dogs 1, but if you go on the forums, people are like, this game was not great. Um, I feel like that could ultimately serve, like that's going to be able to push that conversation about the, ne like the necessity for more characters of color in gaming forward. So were uh, your overall thoughts about E3, were there um, in terms of the diverse characters in games that were announced? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Um, so E3, like I have, you know, the same kind of mixed feelings about E3 that every gaming nerd does. You know, you get really hyped up for it, then it comes, and you're like, ah, and you're like, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, basically all the major publishers uh, made a point of including um, either a woman or a person of color, or in some cases both, um, as main characters in their game, um, which is fantastic. Um, not necessarily, like, I want to say Ubisoft sort of like sh had the biggest showing out. Um, they had Aisha Tyler presenting on stage, and then and then Watch Dogs 2 was sort of like their big announcement, uh, you know, for the event. Um, so they sort of like, in my mind, like won the prize. Um, and in terms of just like uh, other forms of representation, I was a little bummed out uh, that the link that's going to be in the new Zelda game is not a girl. That was like, that was sort of like some of the early buzz. Um, when the first shots of Link with uh, his pony, his side ponytails and his new mm -hmm. tunic came out, we all thought, oh, maybe this will finally be like the first female Link. Um, but that's not quite the case. Um, but yeah. So what about representation? People uh, on on the uh, on the stage, what, what, how did you feel about representation there in terms of people presenting the games? Um, so like I said, Aicha Tyler was sort of like, she's both a woman of color. Um, she's, you know, she's a person of color and she's a woman. Um, she's been, uh, she's done, um, events for Ubisoft for the past couple of years. You know, she's sort of like a known brand for them. And it's been interesting that none of the other publishers have really sort of like followed suit. Um, oftentimes the response is, oh, well, you know, like these people aren't people that work for us. Aisha Tyler's a comedian, you know, she's an actor. She's a, she's a self-professed gamer and she's very vocal about representation in gaming. Um, but Ubisoft made the, uh, they took the initiative to reach out and sort of bring her into the fold. And that's the kind of thing that I would like to see from other publishers do more. Um, that whole idea that there aren't people of color out there who are interested in gaming or there aren't women or queer people who play these games is patently false you know you literally just have to swing a stick on tumblr or twitter and you will hit quite a few of us um so that's like if, if like if there's one thing that i take away from it i will rather if there's one thing that i'd like the publishers to take away from it's like you guys like there's the, like there's a vibrant community out there of people who are more than interested in getting involved and helping you know bring people to your product